so uh, next part of our program, we wanted to dive into some policy issues, right? So before we have this panel, uh, some of which are assembled and others will soon join, um, we, we have Rod Richardson from the Grace Richardson uh, Foundation. And uh, Rod and I met this summer, it's actually still this summer, it feels like a long time ago, but I think it was about a month ago. And um, Rod has been working on a number of clean energy initiatives. And we met in the context of a conference on climate change. And we're talking about uh, the possibility of a national carbon tax. So Rod said, well, you know what, that's an interesting idea, but I have a better idea. So we wanted to give Rod uh, five minutes. I think you should have a handout. Has everyone received a document that describes the plan? So Rod, if you come up, and Rod's going to talk for a few minutes, and then the panel that he's part of will reconvene. Rod, good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. I want to thank Richard and the uh, American Sustainable Business Council for uh, welcoming me here as the new kid on the block. Thank uh, my fellow reality-based conservatives uh, for welcoming me to the uh, table here. Uh, <coughs> uh, since I'm an old-style conservative, I would, thought I'd go with old-style audio-visual aids. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but uh, other than that, uh, the Grace Richardson Fund is all about new ideas. Uh, you know, if, if we do not have new ideas to address the challenges of the 21st century, we might as well go home. Uh, you know, if we're going to sit there and say these new challenges don't even exist, aha, don't close my ears, nobody's going to listen to us. So we have to address new challenges with new ideas, and that's what we're all about. Now, let me say that I'm not an expert in climate. I'm not an expert in energy. What I am an expert in is new conservative policy. And that comes from a deep, uh, long-standing experience gained with the Richardson family of foundations, uh, going back to the Smith Richardson Foundation's activities in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. I was uh, privileged to be able to, I, when I was growing up, I thought that Irving Crystal and Norman Pop Arts were my uncles. They were not so much. Uh, you know, we, the, the Smith Richardson Foundation and a group of other uh, foundations funded all of the ideas that formed the, the Reagan revolution. Uh, Neoconservatism, monetarism, supply side economics, the strategic defense initiative. Uh, we helped support uh, souls and eats and Sakharov, the solidarity movement. We supported uh, school choice when it was just starting. We supported uh, the work of Fernando de Soto in uh, Peru, whose work, by the way, applies to what we're talking about today, strangely enough. Um, <clears throat> so, when you hear from me, you're talking to somebody who's really basically a Reagan conservative uh, who understands the need for new ideas. Now, <clears throat> one of those new ideas I'm going to tell you about today is clean tax cuts and clean deregulation. Uh, and it's a new conservative uh, answer to climate and pollution and also a way to achieve supply side tax reduction. Uh, it delivers clean clean energy, innovation acceleration, higher profits and GDP, and energy independence. So to understand why a policy like this might be useful, you have to understand the political problem with current climate policies. We know that the carbon tax is pretty much dead on arrival in Congress now. Uh, and the reason for that, uh, you know, and, and subsidies and re regulation are very unpopular too among conservatives. And the reason is that those are policies that raise taxes raise spending, and increase the size of government. So they look like, to a basic conservative, they look like a left-wing agenda. They look punitive, they look harmful to the economy, it looks like it's gonna make energy expensive. So it alienates conservatives, ordinary folks, and a huge industrial base. So it results in fierce opposition, polarization, extremism, and gridlock. So, but you can finesse all that. Uh, and the way you can finesse that is going back to your conservative basics. If you want more of something, tax it less. That's a basic supply side idea. And wouldn't you know it, if you think about it hard, supply side economics applies to climate change. 
It's all a question of the supply of carbon, the supply of clean energy. These are supply questions, and they're amenable to supply-side economics. And that suggests a policy, right? You could apply broad, economy-wide, Reagan-style supply-side tax cuts to reward all decarbonizing investments, all clean energy, tech, land water use, efficiency. Now, efficiency is a big one because every single corporation in America can become more efficient. Okay, and it's not hard, it's an investment which delivers profits. So it's in fact the cheapest uh, kind of change at all. And uh, so what, what we're talking about is, <clears throat> in the model of the Reagan tax cuts, uh, we're talking about tax rate cuts to capital investment taxes, to corporate income, dividend, interest, capital gains taxes, even estate taxes, to increase profits and accelerate investment to all opportunities equally. And by that, I mean we are technologically neutral. We don't favor one technology over another. Uh, these reductions should be based on quantifiable reductions based on well-known metrics. And we do have some well-known metrics out of there. We, you know, there can be some discussion about what the metrics should be, but it's useful to know that 5,500 corporations currently disclose their carbon reduction information to the Carbon Disclosure Project. They use something called the GHG Protocol, uh, developed by the World Resources Institute, which is an accounting standard for carbon reduction. Uh, and the CDP grades them, uh, 1 through 100 for the quality of their disclosure and accounting work, and A through, B, A through E for their uh, uh, climate mis risk mitigation. Okay, so you could take those grades that boil down everything from fleet efficiency uh, to uh, renewable energy use uh, to uh, energy intensity of operations. All these different metrics are boiled down to one grade, and you could use that to determine a tax rate. Right? So um, <clears throat> it's technologically neutral, and it has clean deregulation and spending cuts baked in. In other words, clean tax cuts really uh, lowers the need for and the cost and the harm of regulation and subsidy. So <clears throat> you can see right there that uh, you know from the get-go, this policy, unlike the Reagan tax cuts themselves, which didn't do much for uh, spending reduction, this policy really calls for spending reduction as a, as a, as a, as a sideline and a pay for of it. Uh, it justifies uh, most tax breaks economy want. Um, also, it's an easy upgrade to a lot of GOP plans. You could, you could take something like the, the uh, Ryan and, and Brady plan that was, was just announced a few weeks ago uh, and lay this in right into it uh, you know, uh, to, make, to give it more bipartisan appeal. If Trump loses and Clinton wins, there's still a hope for supply side tax cuts using this. Um, <clears throat> all investors would earn rate cuts, cuts easily, profitably, as a reward for growing, growing clean and efficient. Uh, and in addition, you know, it's important to realize that this idea is keyed off of, of the dropping costs, the, well, plummeting costs of wind and solar, which are now uh, in the best locations profitable on subsidies. Uh, so it applies to wind and solar, which is one of the reasons why we're bringing it forward now. But it's not just wind and solar at all. There's lots of other clean tech efficiency. There are many other things that apply to. It's important to understand that um, there are technologies out there that can make fossil fuels cleaner. Uh, flare gas capture. There's a company called Zero, which uh, has a great technology. Flare gas capture. They take the, the gas, they split it into methane, which they use to power the wells so they don't have to use power from the grid. They take the, the other gases and they split them into carbon fiber and hydrogen clean energy. So these guys are not only making uh, fossil fuels cleaner, but they are transforming the fossil fuel industry into the carbon materials and clean energy business. Okay? And they're not getting anywhere near the kind of subsidy support that wind and solar are. 
never mind nuclear and, and fossil fuels and stuff like that. So, so clean tax cuts would help people like this enormously. It would help the fossil fuel industry transform, which almost no other policy out there would do. Well, uh, can, I, can I ask you to... As you okay, so so do so, to, and then we can continue this in the, in the uh, panel. Okay, I will. Uh, Thank you. Bring this down, but but basically you can see the the rest of this. But it's all carrot, no stick. It relevels the playing field in a way that tilts capitalism towards ever cleaner. Um, it's interesting in comparison to the carbon tax. Uh, it it prices carbon, but it does the same thing as a carbon tax, but it does it on the other side by reducing the taxes for the good stuff. Instead of increasing the taxes on the bad stuff, you can decrease the taxes on the good stuff. It's a different way of going about pricing carbon. It's not revenue neutral. It's revenue negative and spending negative. Okay, it brings down the cost of government. It doesn't keep things up here, it brings things down. Um, one of the nicest uh, aspects of it is that when you consider it in relation to subsidies, right, subsidies support a lot of money-losing businesses that could not make it on their own. A tax rate cut only benefits profitable businesses and it benefits profit, the most profitable businesses the most. Okay? The tax rate cut accelerates the most profitable businesses. It gives them the most new investment. Okay? And it also, those guys are usually the low-cost leaders. So what you end up doing is driving down costs the fastest using tax cuts. In any event, that's enough of that, um, and uh, you know it's a, it's a good policy whether climate change is real or not. You don't have to believe in climate change to, to like the benefits of cheaper energy, an economy boost, cleaner air, cleaner water. Anyway, it's a new idea. Uh, a lot of people should consider it. Uh, there's a coalition of think tanks uh, and funders uh, that are coalescing around this, uh, and uh, I'm working with the Jack Kent Foundation. Um, Rob at Conserve America has indicated an interest in working with us, uh, as has Trammell Pro. Uh, we have uh, Amory Lovins at the uh, uh, Rocky Mountain Institute would like to convene a meeting uh, next month with various groups to discuss this. In any event, uh, if you would be interested, talk to me. Conversation with Rod last week, but these are all, all friends of mine and, and peers working in the same area. Um, Concert America was founded 21 years ago, and Dave, raise your hand if you would. Dave Jenkins was a colleague of mine at, at Concert America, and he now runs a C3 called uh, Conservatives for Responsible Stewardship. 21 years ago, we were the only we were we were the only people at this table, and so uh, I'm an eternal optimist. And today we have. Six different organizations represented, at least here. We have some more in the audience, and there are others that aren't here with us today. So um, in the sense of, of my interest of, of helping steer the Republican Party back to its traditional conservation and environmental legacy, this is exciting to me. Okay? Um, what we're going to do is we're going to run through a couple quick canned questions so you can get to know the panel and why they're here. Um, and then we'll kind of pass it back and forth a little bit. We'll try to save a few minutes at the end for questions and answers, okay? Um, so first question for the panelists is, uh, tell us who you, and rather me introduce you, I, I think you introducing yourself, it, it, it helps register with the audience better. So if you can introduce yourself in your organization first, and then we'll come back in the second round. Why is your organization working in this, in this area, okay? Mark, why don't you start? Sure, thank you, uh, thank you, Rob. Um, <clears throat> my name is Mark Pichet. I'm with the uh, Conservative Energy Network, or EFER, uh, as the name implies, a network of uh, state-based conservative clean energy organizations. In fact, I want to introduce some of our network members who are here today. I see Larry Ward with the Michigan Conservative Energy Forum, and 
Tyler Gavilius with the, um, with the Ohio Christian Coalition and also uh, a board member of the Ohio Conservative Energy Forum. And Keith Ben Hollander, um, who is the Midwest Director for the Christian Coalition and a board member for the Michigan Conservative Energy Forum. And Ash Mason is here. Is Ash still here? Ash is the Southeast Director for the Christian Coalition and is the point person for conservatives working on a couple of pretty important ballot initiatives around solar energy in Florida right now. And so uh, we work with about a dozen states currently who have formal organizations and are uh, building uh, additional state-based efforts in about a dozen other states currently. Um, we are not a national organization like my um, colleagues here on the panel today. We are entirely focused on state work, uh, working in state capitals, and helping to build a conservative footprint uh, on the ground in the states that we operate in. So uh, I'm also a partner. My day job is I'm a political consultant. I am part of the evil establishment, if you don't mind saying it. Uh, and I've been working in Republican politics for about 35 years, including a stint as uh, the campaign director of the National Republican Congressional Committee. So uh, my passion, my reason for being here, uh, if you unlike uh, the other panelists, is I want to win elections. And I see energy as a gateway for us to uh, fortify our, band, our brand among uh, elements of, of the electorate that are extremely important for us to win uh, elections in the future. Younger voters, uh, females, uh, Hispanics, um, uh, and uh, <clears throat> if we're going to get there, we've got to have a narrative on the energy. So that's the reason that I have to do My name is Michelle Combs, and I am the chairman and the founder of Young Conservatives for Energy Reform. And like Rob and Dave, I got involved about 10 years ago, and it was not a lot of people in this space, and I'm so happy for them. Um, they were one of the few people that I met in this space, and I am a former chairman of the Young Republicans and been involved in the Republican Party for a long time. We were just talking, this is like our fourth convention. So it's real exciting to see all these people here. When I first got involved, I couldn't find anyone. I got involved because of my son. When you have your child, you can't eat fish because of the mercury. And I went around and I asked people, you know, what is this about the mercury? What is this? Is this, this should be a pro-life issue. And people were like, oh, that's a liberal issue. I'm like, no, this is a family issue. So I got invited to an event. I was just looking for something to do with the environment. And I got involved, um, I got invited to this um, event in Colorado and there was about 30 people there. And the first person I met was Al Gore. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, this is, this is not where I'm gonna find conservatives in this issue, because I know people agree with me, even though the Gores were very kind to me. So when I came to Washington and started working with this, Rob and David were very kind to me, and I started working on the cap and trade bill um, back in 2010, and got my mom involved, who is the chairman of the Christian Coalition of America. And the first person we went to see was Senator Lindsey Graham. He was a very good friend of ours and our senator. And um, we partnered with the National Wildlife Federation. So at the very first meeting, um, Lindsey said, I'll take this issue on as long as y'all are behind me. And I think that is so important to our groups. We have to show our Republican legislators that we are behind them. And we were partnered with the National Wildlife Federation at the time, so they called us the gods and gun group. It was, it was, it was funny. So we, we worked on that and you know, we worked very, very hard with a lot of groups at this table. And I realized as I was talking about this issue that the young people really got this issue, and especially the millennials. They grew up recycling, they grew up with this issue in their head. It's not, it doesn't have the stigma that the older Republicans do. So I called up a lot of my friends who were involved with me in the young Republicans, and I started this group called Young Concerns for Energy Reform. We have over 100,000 people now. We're organizing all over the country. We have state chairmen, county chairmen. Um, we partner with the military. We take a lot of the military in and a lot of retired generals to speak on behalf of national security and energy independence. We have a national forum every year. Last year, we had so many success stories that came out of our, um, of our forum. We had people doing things all over the country. So I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to be at this convention. I'm excited to be with everyone at this table who I consider my family in this issue. So thank you for inviting me. I look forward to talking to you.
My name is Teddy Roosevelt, and a hundred years ago, my party led this nation and the world to designate, protect, and conserve public lands. And now I'm at the Republican National Convention in 2016, where our party has decided to sell them, which is a bummer. So, uh... Katrina? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I am, I'm, my name is Alex Bosmowski. I am, uh, am a member of RepublicEN.org. We are trying to take the issues of environment conservation and climate change back from the environmental left to their true home on the eco-right and empower conservative grassroots to show America that not only do we care deeply about the environment and climate change and solutions, but we have better answers than the left. We are a scrappy bunch of eco-right conservatives that are traveling the country, finding other like minds, and our little project at this convention is to show our hashtag Teddy Face. Um, all of you should have one on your seat, and if you don't, come get one from me. And thank you so much to ASBC and to Rob and my colleagues for having us, including us here. RepublicEN.org is uh, has big ambitions, but we need a lot of support. And also, I am curious, Richard, who did your portrait? Because uh, I thought that was pretty cool. I could. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Hey, y'all. My name is Katrina Rock. I'm with an organization called the Art Street Institute. We're a pragmatic libertarian think tank. I know that that might sound weird, but I promise that it's true. Uh, and we work towards making practical suggestions for how to apply uh, libertarian ideals towards governance. I run our energy program, um, and I come to this issue um, uh, directly from uh, pricing carbon. Um, so Ron and my family are um, I, uh, by happenstance, found myself working under a fellowship for former uh, representative Bob Inglis in South Carolina. And he asked me if I would help him write a carbon tax bill, um, which was quite alarming because I didn't know anything about tax policy and hardly anything about carbon, and I had to combine the two of them. It was a really fun experience, actually, um, and sort of made me um, drink the Kool-Aid on the ideas that Republicans and conservatives can apply to problems that Republicans and conservatives might not pay attention to all the time. Uh, since then, I've worked on the carbon tax on and off, um, and at uh, the R Street Institute, I'm trying to expand those ideas uh, towards the energy market as a whole. Um, libertarians are really great at suggesting our government has stepped beyond its boundaries, and we see that all over the place in energy. Uh, conservatives like to say that markets work for everything, and too often we hear that markets work for everything except energy, uh, and I'm here to try to change that. Hello, my name is Jerry Taylor. I am the founder and president of the Scanning Center in Washington, D.C. Uh, we opened for business a couple of years ago. Prior to starting the Scanning, I was a uh, director of natural resource studies for the Cato Institute in Washington for about 20 odd years. I became a senior fellow and vice president. And I left Cato to start the Scan for a number of reasons, one of which, however, uh, is what brings us together today. Uh, for most of my career at Cato, I was a climate skeptic. I would go on Fox News and the Wall Street Journal and at speaking engagements and engage in every debate in which someone would invite me to argue against everything that most of you in this room believe. Uh, but over the course of my career at Cato, I changed my mind. Uh, for the, the, the very simple reason is that I was prompted to do a little due diligence on the arguments I was for. This some, is something that is a radical concept in Washington. For the most part, people in my business, in the, in the business of gunslinging for public policy, take whatever they can find with utility and use it with relish. However, I wanted to argue, I wanted to make the best arguments for our side possible, which means directly wrestling with the narratives from the climate uh, mainstream community. And it turns out that if you wrestle with those arguments honestly and seriously, uh, they're very compelling. Uh, it didn't happen overnight, but over the course of my career at Cato, I gradually changed my mind both on the science and on the economics. And, uh, and this was one of the several animating factors which prompted me to leave the Cato Institute to start the Scanning Center. Because while my old colleagues consider this akin to, say, leaving, um, leaving uh, the party of Reagan for the party of Mao Zedong, 
the reality is, is how you look at atmospheric physics and how you read science has nothing to do with how you feel about limited uh, uh, government, individual liberty, uh, or personal autonomy. There is no ideological view of science. There's simply science. And if the science tells us that uh, climate change is a significant risk that puts the future of the planet at stake, and that we're rolling dice for the very future of our, of our planet by not acting, then there's nothing conservative about playing that game of dice. And there's nothing market-oriented about uh, uh, rejecting market-oriented responses to greenhouse gas emissions. Now, uh, Rod and I will probably disagree about what that might look like, but, the, but one point I think is important to discuss before we get into the bigger details about this is that we already have a carbon tax. It's just a very lumpy, invisible carbon tax imposed by regulation in a very haphazard fashion in disparate sectors of the economy. So that ship is sailed. The only issue is, are we going to have a clean, economically efficient carbon tax that accomplishes as much as we possibly can accomplish to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Or are we going to have an economic, costly, inefficient, lumpy carbon tax that is invisible from the American people, yet still has a very significant economic impact on the country? We argue for efficiency in the same way that Milton Friedman would and F.A. Hyatt did and all sorts of libertarians who can out free market anybody in this room for the most part. Uh, and uh, that's our mission in Washington, to talk to elected Republicans in the House and the Senate and in the governing networks of Washington to try to provide vehicles by which they might better position themselves on the What do you say? <laughs> Ron, another bite of the apple? Sure. Um, you know, just let me say that um, the first Richardson fund, fund is uh, new to the, the public policy and we're giving out some Richardson Foundations and the other Richardson Family Foundations have been there for a while. We used to be a, dedicated to uh, medical research and in fact we still do some. But that part of the program phased out. Uh, I considered you know, what, what to do. Uh, the, the, the question of new ideas in the conservative movement was one that seemed to me to be pressing. That, the conservative movement was a hotbed of new ideas in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, and that seemed to have petered out. And, and there seemed to be a sclerosis that, that, that set in. Uh, so, to me, it, it seemed important to, to bring those forward and, and, and try to revive the creation of new ideas. Um, you know, I do want to say, you know, to uh, Katrina and Jerry, I'm not opposed to carbon pricing. I just think there's a better way to do it. Uh, you know, you don't. You know, they, when you when you talk to conservatives, you know, there are people on the, in the green conservative movement are always talking about how to talk to conservatives because they're constantly getting rejected. Uh, so they think, well, if we talk better, maybe something will improve. But the problem with the words is that, well, you know, if you really want to know a word that conservatives hate. It's tax, right? So if you're going to start with lead with a tax, you're going to have whatever problems. It's just a semantic thing. You can't get around it. Uh, so you know, if you're going to talk about tax, you really improve your position if you add the word cuts. After, <laughs> so if you, if you just start talking about a carbon tax cut, you would have won the uh, world energy policy scrabble game, right? So, so you know, for conservatives, so you know. I'm not opposed to tax and carbon, but there is a way to finesse it from coming from the other side. You can do the same thing. So, you know, there really is a third option to your two options. You know, yeah, there is a carbon regulatory carbon tax. You could have a real carbon, but you could also have a pay tax cut and clean deregulation. That would be the third option. So, in any event, you know, I, I uh, and by the way, I came up with this idea not as a leader of climate change, but as a climate agnostic. You know, this is a climate policy that makes sense. You know, I came up with this as a way to avoid the nightmare of regulation and subsidies and all this, you know, the big government agenda that I saw coming on this movement. You know, I said, you know, look, there's a small government, government reducing way to do this. Um, anyway. Um, a, a couple of our panelists, in fact, most of our panelists have a connection to former Congressman Bob Inglis, and it reminds me of my favorite story. Um, most, many of you probably are familiar with the fact that when he jumped on the, we need to do something about climate bandwagon, 
he was primaried and lost his election, and was, even though he had a, like one of the best conservative, American conservative uh, union ratings in Congress. And, and we worked with Bob. What happened to Bob was that he had a son who was roughly college age or just out of college. He came to him and said, Dad, if you don't start working on climate change, I'm not voting for you next year. <laughs> And so Bob started digging into it, and that's what got Bob rolling and spawned uh, at least one of the organizations here and has helped informed others. Um, the other, another thing that uh, the panel just brought up, um, one of the knocks against the Republican Party is we've stopped being the, part of the party of ideas. Um, over the last eight years or even longer, we, we've stopped being the party of ideas. Well, here we have a panel with, a, with, with maybe competing ideas, but we're all coming from the same uh, the same desire to solve a problem or um, make things better, either environmentally or tax policy-wise. Um, so we do have some competing ideas, and, and so I want to throw out to the panel now uh, the actual title of our of our panel. You know, what are some policies that enhance the national environmental security? Or you know, if you have a unique approach to that answer, please go off in your own direction. Um, we probably only have time for one more round before we take questions and answers, I think, give or take. So, um, Mark, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Rob. Um, you know, the, uh, as I mentioned previously, I am, I am, I am a political guy, I'm a campaign guy, I'm not uh, a policy expert at the table. What we designed uh, the Conservative Energy Network to do and, and, and to support the work that's happening at the state level uh, and some of the great leaders that are here today. Our vision was to create a new space, a tent where conservatives, Republicans can gather and talk about solutions to, uh, to energy, to growing um, our nation's commitment to uh, clean, renewable energy, energy efficiency, the ways that conservatives are comfortable talking about it. You know, much of what we don't like about policy today uh, as it relates to clean energy, whether it's their mandates or subsidies or other corny and overregulated types of solutions, is that they came from the left. And you know, our response has been uh, to oppose them, to try to tweak them, make them better, or in many instances, as soon as we regain control of the state capital, to undo them. And uh, our approach is, is different in the sense that you know, we want to uh, start developing conservative solutions and tapping some of the great brain power that's at the table here today uh, at the state level. And as you know, most observers would, would know, not a lot is happening in Congress these days of a substantive nature. And most of what's happening to move all forward on clean energy is actually happening at the state level in state capitals across the country. And so we work with governors, we work with state legislators, uh, to come up with new ideas, new ways to approach uh, energy and, and ultimately we want to see more renewable energy, more energy efficiency, and use towards more green. Um, just for the, at the state level, and this is where I, I, I depart from my other panelists here for a moment, is that we're not about climate, uh, not because we, we disagree or because we don't uh, think it's important, Rather, it's at the state level, it's really just not what our fight is. Um, and what we talk to uh, climate advocates about is that um, we're going to help get you there. Um, and we are a better position to support what you're doing uh, by bringing people along in baby steps. And for many Republicans, uh, taking the jump to climate is a big leap. And if we can get them in the door through renewable energy and supporting, for whatever reason that is, if it's national security, if it's faith, if it's uh, jobs, economic development, and supporting the agricultural industry in this country. That's, that is a great transition to uh, moving in the nation in, in a policy direction that supports reducing carbon and making the air and water and our natural resources uh, healthier and, um, and more profitable. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Michelle. Thank you, Mark. And I totally agree. I think um, for years, it's always been about the messenger and the wrong messenger for the Republicans. And I think it's education, and that's really what our group is all about, is about educating and educating our message. But um, when we first started, we partnered with the military. We partnered with CNA, which is made up of retired admirals and generals. 
and one general in, um, who spoke at our very first event, General Zilmar, he was over in Iraq, and he tells a lot of the stories about how we got to make the military faster, you know, better, more efficient. Um, there were so many of our young men and women that died on these convoys when they were taking oil, because it takes like, I think in World War II, it took like one gallon for war, now it takes 25 gallons per soldier to run a war. So that really resonated among our group, that we, if, the, if the military is leading the way, becoming more efficient, becoming better, I think that resonates with Republicans. I've seen it over and over. So we take, we take them around and speak to our different groups, and we talk about how we can do this on a local level and how um, that we need to become more energy efficient. It's like a three-prong. It's um, innovation, efficiency, and economic economics. And that resonates among our people. We, I mean, I many of us at this table were part of a poll that came out about a month ago. It was so encouraging, um, especially among the young people who care about the goals of environment. Who care? I think we actually energy environment pulled higher than um, like pro the, the gay marriage issue or even immigration, which was really, really um, you know different from years gone past. So I think that. That's very encouraging that you know the Republicans are caring more and more about this issue. But I think the number one is just educating and getting out there and breaking these stigmas where this is not a Republican issue, this is not a, a liberal issue or a conservative, but this is a family issue. And I think the more and more we get out there, the more we educate our grassroots, the more you're going to see Washington. There really is a disconnect from what happens in Washington and what happens in the states. But the more I know we've all gone to see members of Congress, and they really need us behind them because they do want to do more environmental legislation. How many of you guys are sustainability professionals or your job is to talk to people about energy, environment, climate change, or your journalists and your and your um, writing about the issues? Okay. And how many of you guys are conservative activists and your job, I mean, you, more than communicating to conservatives about climate change, you'd be wanting to talk to moms, millennials, minorities about how conservative principles fit their world. Okay. Um, I think those are two different lines of inquiry here. So I'll quickly address both of them after I just say for, on the policy topic. Um, whatever Katrina and Jerry said. At <laughs> uh, well, republican.org will be, will be standing behind. And, and there's a, a real... If you're on the left, it's really easy to say, oh, here's a, we have a problem, and these are 47 different policy options to deal with. Because the government can be an activist. There's, you're not restrained by principle to invent a whole bunch of creative, innovative policy options in government programs. Do you have a problem? I got a government program for you. Um, and that has been the Democratic platform for a long time, which is how it's evolved into a rat's nest of special interests. Um, a little harder. Um, a little harder for conservative. We're restrained by principles. And that's why I don't think we have a huge laundry list of uh, policy options that are available for us to us to address climate change. You gotta stop free riders from socializing their soot. You're not allowed to dump for free with the trash dump in the sky without paying a ticket fee. And we, the, the clean energy technologies that have to compete with these free pollution guys, because they can't, they have to compete for political patronage. So you gotta get in the political patronage and you gotta get in the free pollution and there's really one major option to doing that and these two are the best people in the world for describing it. It's a border adjustable revenue neutral carbon tax. Uh, and it lets you unwind a lot of the bad stuff that has accreted over time that's supposed to proxy for a price on carbon. Uh, so if you're a conservative, or if you're an uh, environmental professional, if you're a sustainability advocate, and you're trying to talk to conservatives about getting them on board with clean energy or climate action, then yeah, you gotta watch your words depending on who you're talking to. You know, it's probably not the best idea to go in guns blazing and say, where climate change is the biggest threat to national security and we need you to help solve it. That's probably not the best way to approach that. Um, you should talk about how we're already getting taxed, and this is how we can uh, satisfy the needs of moms, millennials, and minorities in the 85% of this country that thinks we need to deal with this problem without growing government. You know, you have to approach it with language that they're familiar and comfortable with. But 
for conservatives, for those conservatives out there, and you want to grow your movement, and you want to get the moms, millennials, and minorities that we've been hemorrhaging um, back to the table, then you got to talk about in the language that they care about, and they all care about climate change. So don't go see foot around it. Climate change is the word. It's the problem. It's what's happening. And it's what we need to be offering a solution to. And so you go in there and say, well, you know what the last platform on climate change is? It's, it's anti-fracking, it's anti-nuclear, it's anti-infrastructure, and it's pro-clean power plant. And every one of those things raises emissions. Except for the clean power plant, which marginally reduces them after it ships a bunch of emissions to China and India. You can beat the environmental left on substance by saying, we're actually pro-fracking. Globalizing the shale gas revolution is the greatest short-term thing we can do to reduce emissions. Shutting down Diablo Canyon raised emissions in California by 18%. Something like that. Um, and, uh, and the Clean Power Plan ships emissions overseas. So let me tell you how conservatives can offer the country a better solution. Um, but, uh, and, and maybe those people are motivated for a solution. And because the left doesn't have a solution, but they get all the credit because they're the only ones that talk about it with big rhetoric. Uh, everyone who cares about the environment goes for them. There's a reason that 60% of millennials are fiscally conservative and they can vote for Obama. It's because we tread on these issues they find important to live. We need to say they're important, we care about them, and we have better solutions than the left. Uh, if we do that, we're gonna have so many more young people anxious to brag about how they're conservatives. They can go into class and instead of putting their head down when, when, uh, when climate change comes up, they can say, I have a better answer. And that's what we need. We need to be able to, so to bifurcate your language, depending on what you're talking to. I guess that's the moral of my story. So I think to talk about how conservatives can positively impact um, national and environmental security and policy changes, we need to talk about why policy isn't working today. And that policy that affects the environment largely comes from an EPA that's operating under really old authorizing legislation. So the last time we amended the Clean Air Act was in 1990. And most people didn't know about or care about climate change in 1990. And these are the rules that we're using to limit carbon emissions from the entire economy. Like, no wonder it's a total bonehead move, right? Um, the EPA is outdated in, in a number of ways, and every time they come out with a new regulation, we find out why. We sort of reach the limits of what we can do with the things at EPA's disposal, and it's time to rethink how EPA, how government, interacts with pollution in everyday life. So we can mandate reductions, sure. Um, we're reaching the natural limits. We can't reduce ozone as easily anymore, and we're seeing counties in unattainment regularly. The next time we ratchet down ozone, we'll see national parks out of attainment for ozone because ozone's created naturally. So we can't really get rid of that regulation. Uh, and we should rethink how we want EPA to play a role in our lives. I think that the EPA has gotten pretty comfortable um, testing the limits of what we've asked it to do with authorizing legislation. Uh, we see that in rule after rule, and now the Supreme Court has started pushing back. Uh, that's a pretty good indication that they've gone too far. So conservatives, uh, being that we're interested in shrinking the size of government and limiting the way that government interacts with us in everyday life and making government more effective and productive, we should offer an alternative. I think that in carbon, um, Jerry's going to cover this quite well, the revenue neutral carbon tax that replaces EPA regulation is just one conservative suggestion for how to ratchet down EPA uh, in this really important area as it's overstepping its bounds in a pretty farming way. But I also want to recommend that we start thinking more clearly about energy choice. So um, we want energy abundance, right? Energy abundance and national security, they seem to go hand in hand. And we're seeing abundance, right? Uh, the oil and gas boom that we've had in recent years has been so tremendous, not just for economic security, but for reducing carbon emissions. And we don't want to forget that, that fossil fuels can play a role in making our energy future more sustainable and secure. But we're also seeing a lot more choice for renewable energy. People want to put solar panels on their rooftops. Businesses want to be able to buy renewable power from sources that are not their utility. And we have regulations in place that limit people's ability and businesses' ability to do that. Now, conservatives should care about that. Conservatives should care about how government is limiting their operations. 
and we have the tools to replace that with a new structure that promotes choice and that promotes new technologies. I think we should do that. I think, uh, Rob, you mentioned that everyone at this table starts from the same place and may take different avenues to this that of position. I'm not entirely sure that's true. Uh, here's where I start. I'm not a climate agnostic. I'm not. I believe that the IPCC members are not communist plots from China, as the nominee of this party said just uh, a few months ago. I don't believe that it is socialist nonsense. It is hype. It is what 97% of all scientists believe, given the data. The debate is about how much warming we will have. Will it be modest, or will it be catastrophic? That's the debate. Even from the scientists that Republicans put on panels in the House and the Senate testimony, whether we're talking about John Christie or Judith Curry or my old colleague Pat Michaels at the Cato Institute or Roy Spencer, we can go through all the uh, climate skeptic uh, baseball cards. When they're not playing to the crowd at Fox News or in the United States Senate or House, and they're actually talking to scientists or talking to think tank types like me where they value their intellectual credibility, they will concede that climate change is happening. It is significantly driven by industrial emissions. Warming will continue in the future. They are skeptical, however, that the more uh, catastrophic scenarios that are discussed are particularly likely. And that's where the debate is. So I am not a climate agnostic. So if we are going to manage risk, we have to acknowledge that this isn't really about what's the most likely outcome from climate change. It's how do we address the full range of possible outcomes from climate change in a sea of uncertainty. And given the full distribution of risk here, it requires us to act robustly. Just as Republicans don't look at Iran and say, what is the most likely uh, 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 consequence of Iran having nuclear weapons? Most likely consequences they're never used. But that's not the only possibility. There are outliers, there are risk factors, and so we don't look at the most likely outcome. We calibrate our policy and foreign policy leaders to look at the full range of possible outcomes. If we were doing that in, in, in financial markets, we're doing our own lives, right? If we looked at the most likely outcome of how we invest in our money, we put all our money in stocks, and an index want to walk away every single year. We don't do that, we hedge against it. It is conservative. People who don't hedge against risk are not thought of as conservative. So I go with this entire preamble because if you really do take the IPCC correct, you know, as, as an honest statement of scientific knowledge, and you accept what 97% of the scientists in this field say, which I do, then while Rob's agenda may be politically an easier lift for the Christian Center than the ambitious one that we're offering, it won't do the job. Right now we're decarbonizing at around 2% globally a year. We need to decarbonize about 6.5% a year for the next 30 years to hit the targets that we've established in Paris to keep the globe from warming more than 2 degrees Celsius over pre-industrial background levels. I don't mean to go too deep into the weeds about this, but where we start from this debate is that this is a very serious problem that demands a serious policy response which is why we default towards pricing carbon, because as much as it may be easier to do these other things, it will not do the job. So for instance, in the renewable energy sector, the effective tax rate is trivial. In the nuclear power industry, the effective tax rate is a negative 42%. The nuclear industry does not pay taxes. They are net recipients of government funds, 42% of their revenue. This is stunning. The tax rate is not what's in the renewable energy uh, growth of market share. They're growing in market share. There's been tremendous advantages. But it has absolutely nothing to do with, you know, with, with it, it's, it's not because there have been tax cuts provided. The fact is, right now, they are already being very heavily advantaged through the tax code, which is good in the scan of the real wealth. There's just not a whole lot more gain there. So if we want to be the party of ideas, we need to have an agenda that is at least competitive with Democrats. And let's be very clear what the Democrats have right now. Thanks to Massachusetts versus EPA, the Supreme Court has said the Clean Air Act governs greenhouse gas emissions, which means they no longer need to talk to Congress at all. EPA is virtually unbounded in its ability to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. And they are going to put the pedal to the metal and use that regulatory authority to the greatest extent they can. As someone who accepts IPCC narratives, that's not necessarily the most horrible thing. 
we have to address greenhouse gas emissions and Congress won't act and EPA is going to have to. I think we can do a far better job of it. But the point is, this idea of, you know, conservative clean energy and tax cuts and some more anodyne easier lifts, which are indeed easier lifts, is that going to induce the Democratic Party to say, oh, I guess we don't need the EPA regulatory authority act. No, we don't need to No, we don't need to talk about keeping it underground. No, we don't need to talk about Keystone Pipeline and other energy infrastructure. No. They'll say, fine, take your tax cuts. Awesome, awesome. And we're going to keep it The reality is, if as Republicans, we we can do a better job than regulation. We need to offer something that is as good and that could indeed induce a deal. And this agenda is not going to do that. Let me just now wrap up just for a sec because so much of this is about politics and not policy. I've been mostly talking about politics. But let's talk about politics first. There is an incessant conversation, as Alex mentioned, about how to talk to conservatives about politics. Now let's think back. Did conservatives always have these views? No. In 2008, only eight years ago, the Republican Party nominated John McCain, who argued for more aggressive climate action than even the Waxman Markey cap and trade bill would have provided that came out of the Democratic Congress. Was there riots in the streets in the, in the Republican Party over the fact they were, at, they were nominating a climate activist? No. In the 2008 Republican platform, it could very well have been written by Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. It talked about the need to get fossil fuels out of the economy in the quickest manner possible, but we will use market mechanisms to do it, which is exactly what we argue today. Conservatives can live with it then. What happened? Were they, was there some sort of political rapture in which they all disappeared and were replaced by Trump? No! <laughs> the fact is this party responds to political leadership. If Donald Trump had idiosyncratic views on climate, just like he does on a number of different issues, I am absolutely certain the Republican base would have followed lockstep. The reality is, is that if you look at public opinion surveys, 70%, 70% of the American people believe climate change is a real significant problem that demands a serious federal response. 70% of this electorate that this party is not talking to, 56% of Republicans, according to almost every survey I've seen over the last two years, finds that Republicans and Republican leaning independents agree with the exact same thing. And this party says nothing to them. And acts as if somehow that doesn't exist. This party has been taken by the throat by political extremists on this and many other issues. They represent about a third of the public, and we're obsessing about how to talk to them because they hold this party house. If the Republican Party is going to be obsessed about how to talk to the most extreme wings in its party and then hold its entire campaign hostage to that, it will face political defeat again in November and continue on. There is a bigger electorate out there one that is entirely opposed to the direction this party takes, and one which this party can talk to, if it had the courage to do it. I actually have only had two cups of coffee. One quick sentence, I'm sorry. Remember, remember in 2009, cap and trade, cap and trade was the word. Sean Hannity turned that into cap and tax in one second. One second. So we can start naming it something else, but I mean, if Russia and Hannity decides that they want cap and tax, you know, we can't control it. Uh, Rod, before we hand it over to you, I think to finalize before we get to q and I guess I think Jerry just hit on your, what I meant was, and thanks for calling me out on it, was the end of your comments. I think we're all here because we want, for whatever motivation, we want the Republican, conservative, libertarian movement to, to have ideas that compete and beat the ones coming from the left. Uh, whether it's because we want Republicans to win at the local, state, federal level, or because uh, from an economic policy standpoint, we think our policy is a lot better. So thank you for pointing that out. Rod? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, let me say, Jerry, I entirely agree with about the last Two minutes of your talk. It was great. <laughs> so that was, that was very good. Um, and I'm very, very glad that you mentioned risk management because, uh, and you mentioned investors and how investors handle risk because actually one of the ways that investors handle risk best and increase their returns best is by diversifying. Uh, it makes no sense at all for most investors to own one stock. They do not own one stock because that would be an insane way to invest. You would have so much risk in your portfolio uh, that uh, you would not do well. Uh, they generally have a, a 
stable of uh, good companies. So, you know, there, there isn't anything inherently um, opposed to doing a clean tax together, clean a, a uh, clean tax cut with the carbon tax. You can certainly do the two policies together, and in fact, uh, they would work twice as well, right? You would have bigger bang for the buck than you would doing either one alone. Uh, so there's no reason to take the attitude of like, oh, we're never going to do that. We have to do this only. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. You want a stable of policies to be successful. And you, you know, you would be well served uh, to have a policy that has the word tax cut in it rather than just one that has tax in it because that's going to be a better sell. So, you know, yes, is it easier lifting? Yeah. <laughs> that's, the, that's the point. It is easier lifting. You can, you can get something more easily passed. And I want to know, I, I was very pleased to see when I looked at the, the scanning website that you have two important guidelines for your work. One is embracing relative policy improvements, incrementally, maybe not everything you want, but a lot of what you want. And number two is willingness to compromise. So, you know, what I'd like to say to you, Jerry, is I would love to meet with you and sit down and talk about in the scanning center taking the clean tax cut seriously and bringing it into your stable portfolio of policies because you will do better as a policy investor by diversifying. Well, I appreciate the offer, and I just want to make fully really clear. We, we, we have in Washington lots of discussions like this. Is this outside the boundary of political reality? Is this more doable? What's the lift? We focus at the scanner relentlessly on Republicans, elected members of the House and the Senate, their senior staff, senior Republican staff, and Republican leadership. And there are a lot of conversations we have that I can tell you that I'd have to kill you over because they're a deep background and behind the closed door. But I can tell you this. The car pricing carbon is not quite the heavy lifting thing. Right now, there are a number of Republicans who know we need to do something very aggressive about climate. The political equilibrium is not stable on this issue. Even if they're climate agnostics, they realize that this is a political loser for them in the long run. And if we cannot price part, if we can't manage this, then the only way we are going to get the emissions reductions we need to meet these scientific standards is the democratic standards. Okay. And, and so, yeah, we're in a compromise business. But the proof will be in the, put, the eating of the pudding next year. We're working on producing a carbon tax bill from Republican legislators in the House and the Senate. I am very confident we'll have that unless Trump pockets in November eliminates every Republican I've ever talked to. Uh, so we'll have something in play for the first time since Bobby was put a carbon tax in play. We will have Republican carbon taxes in play in the House and the Senate. And then we'll see what happens when that lightning rod is, is staked on the ground and the thunder storm comes. Well, I, I wish you luck, Jerry, but I do want to point out that the House just overwhelmingly passed the resolution that they did not want carbon tax. And so most of the people that we worked with voted for that because it was anodyne, it was non binding, and they weren't ready for the jail work. Right. So what are they going to do? Well, because the, 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 only, the only thing I want to say is, you know, according to your own guidelines, this should be something that you should address because you can do it with the carbon tax. Um, but, but, but in any event, you know, the other point I wanted to make is it's not true that a carbon tax is more powerful than clean tax cuts. Clean tax cuts would be every bit as, as effective. Uh, and they certainly would be more effective than the subsidies that are in place now. You know, the subsidy, you know, you get... Why a tax cut is simply a tax preference? It's a no, it's not at all a tax preference. The subsidy supports a lot of very inefficient businesses. A, a tax cut only supports profitable businesses. You know, and it supports the most the low cost leaders the most, accelerates them the most. Also, the power of the tax is more. Uh, Christina Roman, the uh, uh, chairman of Obama's uh, uh, you know, Council of Economic Advisors, did a study with her husband, uh, David Roman, about the effects of taxes on the growth. They found that looking at the Reagan tax cuts, the, the Kennedy tax cuts, the Bush tax cuts, the history of of tax cuts. They found that $1 of tax cuts equals $11 of new investment equals $3 of growth. Now, if that compares with the subsidy, 
right, where you get a 30% ITC, ITC, you get, uh, for $1 of investment, you get about $2.33 of your investment in the $1 of subsidy. So that's about five times more powerful. And you're talking about not just you know, nuclear energy or, or that, but you're talking about energy efficiency and things like that and, and new fossil fuel innovations. These are things that are already profitable to do. Okay, they, they would benefit from the tax that they would yield more profits. And you're talking about these would apply to profitable companies that want to bring down their tax rates. It's economy-wide, it would have a huge effect. Energy efficiency, tax cut for energy efficiency, economy-wide, would have a huge effect. And you know, it would, it would um, you know, if it, it's something that's pretty easy to do. Most of these companies don't pay taxes at all. Oh, uh, Ron, Ron and Jerry. Apple. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. But you see, Apple, Apple is, you see, you could, you could apply this to every company, like Apple, because they're incredibly efficient, right? Well, that's not right, I know, but, but you, know, you, you know, you talk about applying this to Schlumberger or, you know, any company you want to, uh, you, know, the, you know, every company can, be, can decarbonize. They can be part of this. They can become more energy efficient. They can make your buildings more efficient. They can reduce their energy intensity. Walmart reduced its, its uh, uh, you know, it increased its fleet efficiency of its trucks enormously by, by uh, you know, using carbon fiber trucks. So you're talking, you know, lots of profitable companies out there that you could apply this to. This is, a, it's not just for energy. You know, you're just focusing on carbon and energy. It's not that. It's the whole damn economy, Jerry. Okay. The um, economy is also right now right producing a government that can't pay its bills and deficits are staggering. The public debt is not going to see Okay. If I could step in, one of the. I really miss being near with my gal. Um, um, great discussion. And we have, obviously, we have a couple competing. Um, um, policy solutions that uh, there's a lot of meat to them, um, and I don't. I'm, I think some of the panels will stay around and talk to people, um, and certainly media. Um, I, I think Michelle wanted to make one more comment. Okay. I just I appreciate what everyone's saying on this panel, but just from being out um, in this market I and mean, in this field for over 10 years now, and I know we all represent grassroots. Grassroots is just the key in education. I want to tell you this story. At a Christian Coalition event, we had a climatologist come up and talk about climate change. And this guy came up to him afterwards and said, oh my goodness, I, I agree with this now. For so many years, I thought this was a democratic conspiracy. So it's all about the messenger and it's all about the grassroots. Because the legislators, they will listen to the grassroots. So I just wanted to... Yeah. Well, yeah, and I, I mean, I would point out that the six people sitting here are far better messengers yeah. And, and even on the other side has to offer. Yeah. So I just wanted to talk yeah. about the grassroots. Um, we're we're going to take a couple of questions. We have time for two or three questions. Um, picture is the mic. Thank you, Richard. Um, I'm listening to this tremendous discussion by terrific minds. One in all. And I'm listening from the perspective. I don't know if we have any other electives or former electives here. Uh, but just having played in a swing district, uh, I can tell you in the 2010 campaign, camp and tax was the phrase, not camp and trade, and our voters didn't want to hear uh, the, the tax word at all. I think Ron has a powerful point there, uh, which is taking nothing away from Jerry and Katie, because I do understand the policy uh, implications of uh, and, and the potential power of a carbon tax. So there is the answer lies I, I can submit to you as a former Republican elected somewhere. somewhere in a combination of these approaches. I, I, I agree because the reason the House passed that resolution, okay, anodyne language, what, what, it was a political resolution. Well, that's right, a political resolution because that is what, you know, and we all know in politics you have to get your base out and then you have to expand beyond the base. So to get our base out, we have to use language that tells them we're going to lift burdens, and it's really true. And Michelle, to your point, you're absolutely right. We need an educated populace. That is an effort that requires enormous resources, concentration, and breadth and depth. 
uh, and we're not quite there yet. So uh, no politician can get too far ahead of his or her district, I can tell you that too, nor can you be too far behind. It is a grassroots thing, but so long as we have the base that we have, talking carbon tax to our base or even to our legislators, we'll get them punished just as Bob Angles was. Uh, even today, maybe less so, but I think if we can combine it with the sweetener of the prospect of tax cuts, uh, and I, I think some very brilliant people like you could work that out, then I think we could really have something. Respectfully submitted. Um, while, while Richard is finding the next... Uh, oh, go ahead, yeah, sorry. I just wanted to say that right now our street, we're working on a study uh, where we could completely eliminate EPA regulation of carbon dioxide um, and marry carbon tax the hour now elimination of the current um, while you're going to the next question I, I was called out on Facebook during this conversation by a guy in Michigan and he, he also called out every other Republican we know in Michigan about uh, last night's um, at the convention of jobs and the economy and he claims there wasn't uh, he'll buy a beer for any of us in Michigan who can name or point one actual policy described that was designed to actually grow jobs in the economy I think all of us here think our views have, can grow jobs in the economy. I know first I'm talking with Mark and working with Mark. Um, not even talking about climate change, we're talking about clean energy and things like that, that there, there are enormous upsides. Do you, you think in the tip of your tongue you can share with us, Mark, or on job creation and the economic benefits of clean energy? And, well, yeah. Thank you, Bob. And I, and I think, and I, I agree with what Michelle said, I think to a certain extent our discussion is kind of straight from the, the relevant point here being at a convention, the reason we're having this discussion in Cleveland State and not in the convention hall. And that's because, you know, we need to win the hearts and souls of county chairs, district chairs, uh, party officers, because this is a fight that we're going to win from within, not from without. And we've got to change the party from within the infrastructure, not from management outside of it. And that's how we're going to start, you know, moving this and taking it. A lot of talk here about the politics of this. Um, we need to take politics out of it and, and, and depoliticize the issue. We do that by elevating the voice from, from the right and adding to the messengers that are out there talking about uh, about energy. And, um, you know, and, and the jobs and economic development message is very persuasive, especially when you're talking about getting to public and lawmakers, uh, governors. Uh, it's a competitiveness issue. Um, and, you know, in Michigan, a uh, tale of two states here, Michigan and Wisconsin, both of which passed a renewable portfolio standard back in uh, before Wisconsin in 2005 and Michigan in 2008. In 2005, when Wisconsin passed its, it was seen as a national leader uh, in energy policy, um, and in terms of making room for more renewable energy and energy efficiency. Uh, since then, a uh, Democrat governor was replaced by Governor Walker, um, and who uh, was not part of that policy. And, and in Wisconsin, they've taken these steps to undermine uh, renewable coastal portfolio standard there. In Michigan, uh, passed the very same legislation, uh, and the Republican Democrat government was replaced by Republican Governor Rick Snyder, who instead of undermining it, has found ways to try and perpetuate it and, and uh, reducing the mandates and subsidies portion of it instead of moving towards an energy resource planning process that makes room for the best, lowest cost alternative for energy production. And the result is Wisconsin now has 25,000 jobs in the clean energy sector. Michigan's approaching 85,000. Um, it's a regional competitiveness issue. Uh, Mike Pence in Indiana does a fabulous job going into the clean energy sector there. Uh, same with Governor Kasich here in Ohio. Um, we want to get governors on board. We need to give them the economic reason to do it. And it's about jobs, it's about economic development, it's about putting the manufacturing base around clean energy. And that's how we're going to make progress on the issues. Yeah, hi, actually, I work for an uh, LED manufacturer in Ohio. And we've added almost over 100 jobs in the last year. Uh, we manufacture products for the U.S. Navy, Cleveland Clinic, and several others. But I have two questions. Um, will the carbon tax cuts be more aggressive than the state utility rebates that exist currently, which are pretty sporadic? And number two, what happened uh, from the ESA, the Energy Independent Security Act in 2007 from George Bush, to today with the lack of you know, change? Well, I think it was a 
that could change the union of the uh, What happened in 2008 when this party nominated John McCain and adopted a platform we could all be quite comfortable with to the president is called the Tea Party. In 2010, Christina's former boss uh, had his head put on a pipe, paraded around by Tea Party activists with the message being the rest of the party. This is what happened is if you talk about climate change in general and carbon taxes in particular, and the party shut up. So Jeff Flake, who's a pretty conservative uh, Arizona senator and a friend of mine, libertarian leaning Republican, uh, was in favor of a carbon tax and then wasn't. Why? Because of that. Why did John McCain stop talking about it? Because of that. Why did Lindsey Graham stop talking about it until very, very recently? Because of that. Why do a lot of Republicans I talk to privately tell me, of course it makes more sense to price carbon rather and harness price signals rather than harness regulators at EPA? But they all know. But they're a whole hostage by the Tea Party movement, which has chat, which is a more worrisome thing for most Republican electors in the primaries than not. So why am I optimistic that this isn't an eternal new situation in American politics? First of all, the Tea Party in 2010 pulled 34% of public support. The last time I saw the number it was about 15%, and that was about a year ago, and I'm pretty darn sure they're lucky now if they're in double digits. That's the first reason the Tea Party movement has lost a lot of strength. Second reason is if November plays out as most people think it will, uh, there will be a lot of districts that were not competitive that are all of a sudden competitive. So Republicans cannot simply look over their right shoulder, they have to look over their left shoulder as well. And third on this issue, why I'm not so sure that cap and tax is the eternal death of any part of price in Virginia, is that an innovative plan has been bubbling around that I think helps solve the problem. It's one that gets a lot of traction we talk about. Which is that we're going to tax, this you frame it like this, we're going to tax corporations are imposing risks on the planet. And for whatever reason, look, I'm a libertarian, I don't like the fact that corporate income taxes are popular, but the reality is people do not seem to connect taxing corporations with taxing people. So we're going to tax corporations that are imposing risks on all of us and our kids and our grandkids. And then we're going to take that revenue and give it all back to you and love some things. So you're made whole. And if you consume less than the average amount of energy in this country, you get more of the break than you ever paid in the carbon taxes that were passed on to you by these corporations. And if you consume more energy, maybe you're going to pay more. So you have a perfect incentive. You get it all back. In fact, 54% of the American public would gain in a carbon tax, which was rebated directly to them in a check. Can that change the conversation? I suspect it might. But we have to drop. Because if we take the planet seriously, half steps and political easy lifts, and it isn't going to get the job done in decarbonization. It's simply not. So we have to do what we can. I'll let it be. Uh, what you just laid out is actually the original version of the carbon tax, uh, you know, that was uh, proposed in 1973 by David Wilson, uh, who uh, proposed the carbon tax with, uh, with a public good um, And, <clears throat> you know, to, so it's, it's not exactly new in Washington. Well, new in Washington. New in Washington. But, um, <clears throat> you know, and David, uh, David tried to fly that idea for years in Washington. Got nowhere, but fortunately, you know, it got picked up in Peter Barnes on the left, uh, popularized it under the name Field Dividend. Um, the, um, you know, what you're saying about how it would uh, impact you, uh, it would be much better, uh, you know, basically because <clears throat> for, for a couple of different reasons. Uh, right now, the, the subsidies are very unequal. You know, for, for the different energy sources and you know, clean tech and stuff like that, they're, they're, they make no sense, really. It's not a level playing field. So the clean tax, the entire premise of clean tax cuts is to eliminate the subsidies and replace them with a clean tax cut that's level for everybody. And the nice thing about that is that Harvard uh, economists Greg Mankiewicz did a study on capital income taxes and their effect on revenue. Now, about he concluded that about half of a capital income tax is self financing So in other words, if you cut all the subsidies, right, and replaced it with a clean tax, the clean tax would be about twice the amount of the subsidies. And it would be level. And that would be self-financing. Because it would be half paid for uh, by increased investment uh, and a half paid for by a reduction of spending. So the, the entire Government would decrease. You have a tax cut. You also increase spending at the same time, but you would be able to actually do more 
uh, for companies like you, and it would actually accelerate your investment better. So, you know, again, this is not, uh, to your point, this is not a policy that's just for wind and solar, or, you know, or those companies. This is for the entire economy. But you know, if I could, uh, so that's the that, 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 uh, of policies in the mix, and there's no reason we should be dating each other. We should be working together. Well, I want to go back to we should be figuring Michelle, did you ask something? Okay. okay. So I want to just, I just want to go back to Nan's point, right, which I think was really well stated before we move on to the next day, session, which is, it looks like, you know, there could be some cohabitation around these ideas, some marriage, uh, maybe, eventually. Uh, so I, I, I want to thank Rob for moderating a very stimulating conversation, and we look forward to continuing to work together to build out you know, a much broader coalition to deal with this big issue. So thank you all, and we're going to start our next panel.